Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Page 997 in the Pew Bibles. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. From the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he's made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you open your newsletters there, you'll find an outline. Uh, let me assure you, it's changed overnight, but just you've got plenty of paper there to sketch down notes and maybe an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Top right, household questions, if you want to talk about this later on during the day. Remember, this is the book that we're using to learn the gospel, but what we're actually doing is using this book to summarise God's word. Uh, what we're turning to each week is God's word and how it summarises the good news in six pictures. And this week we come to what's gone wrong. Uh, in March 2017, Kevin Rudd gave an address at the National Climate Summit at Parliament House in Canberra. Uh, he's renowned for famously declaring there that climate change is the great moral challenge of our generation. What's wrong with the world? Kevin says, the human impact on the environment. That's the great moral crisis. Uh, if you go a little further back, and some of us can, back to June 1987, you would have heard another Prime Minister talking, this time Bob Hawke. And Bob Hawke issued a famous statement during an election campaign that by 1990, no Australian child would be living in poverty. And in that case, what's wrong with the world? Wealth inequality. We need to redistribute what we've earned. Uh, I read an article this week from the Times of India, January 2020, that went along these lines. If you think about solving the world's problems or any other problem, you can quickly come across a common solution. The solution is education. When people are better educated, there are fewer conflicts and more great work done. What's wrong with the world? A lack of education. The great solutions, environmental damage, wealth inequality, poor education, that's what's wrong with the world. And yet when we redistribute wealth, when we secure the environment and when we establish a free and robust education system, what do we still have? We've still got a broken world, don't we? We've still got a broken world. So how is it that we've gone from God's very good world with God as the creator, with the world created very good humans in the image of God to rule the world, to give God the honour he deserves? How have we gone from that to this? Let me pray. Father, thanks for this world. Uh, it actually feels quite delightful at the moment with the fans and the sun gathered with like-minded people in security and prosperity and peace. Father, help us uh, not to be lulled into misunderstanding this world and misdiagnosing what's wrong with it. Father, help us to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, as I said with the kids and kids, I hope that you're learning the gospel. I know both youth groups are doing that. 50 teenagers and young kids on Friday went through the gospel again. It's the momentous, life-changing good news about Jesus. The king who died was buried, rose for our sins according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the first truth that we learnt about was creation, wasn't it? Remember that first picture? Uh, God made the world. He's the ruler of the world. He made the world very good. He made us in his image to rule the world under him. 
Remember the verse, Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. That was the slide we looked at last week, wasn't it? And then at the end of that, we recognise that that wasn't what we experienced. And we asked that question, what went wrong? I have point two on the outline. God's made his very good world. He's placed Adam and Eve in the garden he made for them. God has commanded Adam and then Eve to tend the garden. God has provided all that they need. Remember last week how he gave them not only a command but all the tucker they needed, a massive smorgasbord. God's given them one limit. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. One command. Abundant provision. One command. Abundant provision. And in that very, very good garden, now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you'll die. No, you're not, you won't die, the servant said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. There's a question there in the first verse, isn't it? It's a tricky question. It awakens a desire in the woman. Now, at, at this point, please notice the complete apathy of the bloke. He's there. <laughs> He's the one originally spoken to. He's the one originally given the command. Uh, if he had pockets, his hands would be in them and he'd be whistling and ignoring it. Doesn't say a thing. And that question that the snake asks in verse 1 portrays God in a stingy light. It flies in the face of all of the evidence of God's abundant and overflowing generosity. The woman responds, verses 2 and 3, and it shows that she's fallen for that desire, doesn't it? Now, what does she say? She paraphrases God and then she adds the details. We can't even touch it. How stingy is God? The offer's then made in verses 4 to 5, and at this point the snake has abandoned all sense of subtlety or trickery. He just attacks God and lays before the woman an attitude. You can be God. You can be God. You can see the flow of the logic. If God is stingy, God's not generous. If God's not generous, he doesn't have my best interests at heart and I have my best interests at heart and that means I can do a better job of being God than God. That's the heart of the attitude, isn't it? We can be just like God. We can replace God. We can decide right and wrong. We can discern good and evil. We can know what is right. And you notice that when Eve acknowledges that desire, that attitude, she acts on it. And in fact, the attitude and the action go hand in hand, don't they? Desire, attitude, action, all one big conglomeration that says, I want to be God. She decides what is good and evil. She usurps God. She ignores his clear word. She turns her back on his abundant provision. She takes, she eats, she hands to Adam and their eyes are open. Sin will never leave you unchanged. It will change you because you now think you are God. I think I'm God. We now start to understand a little bit about what's broken the world, this thing called sin. And many people in our world will disregard sin. It's a little old-fashioned, isn't it? It's a bit outdated. Not really the most helpful way to become authentically me. 
many people in our world will misuse you. Know, I read an, ast- an astounding article this week from an advertising website, from a think tank, that basically said, recognise the seven deadly sins because they're your best friends in advertising. Pride, everyone wants to be proud, so appeal to that. Last, everyone wants that thing, so appeal to that. We can use sin to make better ads and generate more money. Many in our world will understand that sin is problematic. In fact, they'll read something like this and they'll define sin as rule-breaking and that at least covers it to a point, doesn't it? Rule-breaking. Sin is breaking rules. But if that's all sin is, then sin becomes relative because I'm better than you, I break less rules. Sin becomes graded, that's a worse rule to break than that one. And sin becomes something I can balance out. I committed this sin but I gave that to charity. A sin is not just rule breaking. Sin is blatant rebellion against God by saying I can be God. Sin is blatant rebellion against God by saying I can be God. It's relational, it's rebellious, it's regal. It wants to take the crown. And it's not just an action, but it's an attitude and action. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. It's not relative, it's absolute, isn't it? You either want to be God or you don't. It's not relative. A sin is sin because it actually attacks God and seeks to replace God with yourself. Sin's not just about breaking a rule, but it's about the attitude and action that says, I'm the rule maker. And you can't balance it out. Sin affects all people. Sin infects all people. It's our natural default. Uh, Even the people of God. Uh, You go to the greatest king of God's people, David, who committed adultery, avoided his responsibility, he used the national apparatus to act corruptly, lied and hid. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, wash away my guilt, cleanse me from my sin, for I'm conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always before me against you. You alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you're right when you pass sentence. You're blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. The greatest leader of God's people. Sinful. Notice how he describes it. When he was conceived, he was what? Sinful. Notice how he defines it. It's against God. Notice how crashing it is. And it affects all people. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned our own way. That's a bloke in the Old Testament. And then a bloke in the New Testament writes something similar. It's written, there's no one righteous, not everyone, no one who understands, no one who seeks God because we all want to be God. All have turned away. Together they've become useless. There's no one who does good. There's not even one. Sin affects all people and sin affects all people how much? All the time. Sin affects all people all the time. Nothing new there in what Paul said because way back in Genesis chapter 6 when the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth, how many schemes of his mind, every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. Sin affects all people all the time in all the parts of their humanity. All the people, all the time, all the parts of their humanity. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense. Their senseless minds, hearts were darkened. Every fibre of our existence is damaged by sin. It doesn't mean we're as evil as we can be all the time. But it does mean that all the time... We are evil. Every cell, every mitochondria, every neural pathway, every decision is tainted by sin. 
It has so many consequences, sin. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of this atmospheric domain, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We, too, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. By nature, we were children under wrath, as the others were also. It it damages us. It enslaves us. Uh, That's actually quite confronting in a culture that proclaims freedom, isn't it? that says you are free, independent, able to choose. No, we became enslaved by sin to the world around us. We became enslaved to the one opposed to God, the devil. We became enslaved to our own desires. We can't even control our own passions, our own emotions, our own desires because they're all damaged by sin in such a bleak way that what are we described as there in verse 1? Dead. We are so enslaved to sin that we're the walking dead and it damages our world. Not just because we're sinners living in it, not just because we don't tend it the way we should, but in Genesis 3.18 we're told that the very dirt that Adam looks after is now broken. The very fibre of creation is warped and tainted. More of that next week as Stephen talks to us about the judgment of God. So what's gone wrong? What's turned God's very good world so sour? I. I am. G.K. Chesterton was renowned for answering a long-form essay question, what is wrong with the world? He answered it with two words. Can you guess what they were? What's wrong with the world? I am. I'm what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. Sin is what's wrong with the world. The attitude and action that says I'm God and God's not. That's pretty brutal, isn't it? But it's not unclear. It's quite confronting. It's not grey. But it also confronts our world, doesn't it? You'll see it there on your outline. It's one of the great things about the end of every one of these chapters that it picks up things that confronts our world. And one of the things that confronts in our world is the mantra that we're all good. And what do we say about babies? How innocent they are. And what do we say about certain cultures that we like? What an innocent culture. Because all humans are basically what? Good. That's what the world says. And if humans aren't basically good, then we can at least lay the blame on the external influences that change us, can't we? It wasn't my fault. It was the world out there that changed me. And if we can't lay the blame there, then we can at least blame another group. Your tribe is persecuting my tribe. And yet both experience and God's word demonstrates the falsity of that. (laughs) You see, even when my group gets power, what does my group end up doing? Well, it doesn't do the good stuff, it does the evil deeds. And if humans are basically good, why have they created such evil structures in the world? Jesus nailed it when Jesus actually describes it in this way. He said, what comes out of a person, that defiles him. For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, lewdness, stinginess, blasphemy, pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. Well, we we could go to sincerity because that's the way our world defines what's good, doesn't it? Now let's do away with sin, let's do away with judgment, but the moral life is to be sincere, to be authentic. And, And that reduces sin to being inauthentic and insincere, doesn't it? So long as I'm true to myself. And yet even a moment's pause will tell us how foolish that is because Hitler was very sincere, wasn't he? And so was Pol Pot and Stalin. Well, we could go to the last one, which is a more popular one amongst those who claim to be part of God's people. It it does recognise that we sin, but it also recognises that each of us has just this little spark of goodness in us. 
a spark that God can work with through various means, be they church gathering or Bible reading or doing the sacraments. The problem with that is that first verse in Ephesians 2. What, what were we in our sins? We're dead. Let me tell you, there is no spark in a corpse. Every fibre of our being is warped and tainted by sin. There is no part of our existence that is not tainted by sin. So here is a very grim truth. Sin has broken the world. It's not caught. It's not taught. It is us. It's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God is not. There's a summary, the picture, the verse, the summary. And in that sinful state, do you you know what we humans do? We doubt whether God can, whether God will, or whether God can be bothered to do anything about it, don't we? And that's next week's question. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, today you've confronted us with an uncomfortable truth. Uh, It's been clear. Please forgive us for our sins, what we've done to your very good world, what we've done to you, what we've done to ourselves, and what we've done to each other. Father, thank you that you confront us with this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.